Uh, there is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. The phone number and the text line should be on your screen. Um, you can always dial 211 directly from any phone. And again, if you're worried about you, uh, yourself, or a loved one, please dial 911 immediately. And with that, I will pass it over to Ms. Kathleen Cannon. Good morning, everybody. And I uh, want to thank you all for tuning in this morning and for all the collaboration that you uh, and all of us in Broward County do. Uh, it's uh, Kathleen Cannon and uh, our mantra here is chasing joy every day because 2020 certainly has been a challenging year. Um, our other mantra is uh, collaboration matters and together we can really solve big community and social issues. So again, I wanna thank you for tuning in. You know that today, September 10th, is World Suicide Prevention Day. Literally folks all over the globe are working on this, are trying to uh, solve this issue. We know that suicide is 100% preventable and the globe today is concentrating on this. And right here in Broward County, all of you are concentrating on it. Cannot thank you enough for joining in for this. I think you're aware that we have convened the Broward Suicide Prevention Coalition to address this exact issue here in Broward County. I want to give a huge thank you to Broward Behavioral Health Coalition for funding this effort. And then there's so many partners here who have joined in. I'm going to kind of give a shout out to some of you, but you will all be recognized. I do want to thank 211 Broward County, the Broward County Public Schools, BSO, uh, Children's Services Council, Florida Initiative for Suicide Prevention, Florida DCF, Henderson Behavioral Health, Memorial Healthcare Systems, and again, so many of others have really working hard on this and collaborating. So thank you for that. Uh, the coalition, uh, we were tasked with creating a system-wide improvements to suicide care, and of course, for crisis response right here in Broward. Uh, we identified a model for our community called Zero Suicide, which you are certainly gonna learn more about. It is a national pre best practice framework for implementing evidence-based practices. It's been proven to work, and that's why we adopted it here. Uh, we're hosting the event today um, as a coalition to share the importance of the zero suicide and help it can reduce deaths. Uh, it can improve lives. It can save families, um, and that is the goal here. Now, the initiative here, we are labeling it Zero Suicide Broward. So we're going to put the Broward on there. And the folks from Zero Suicide are very happy that we're doing that. Uh, again, this is a national best practice. It's a framework. It's evidence-based. It has been proven to work. Uh, you will learn today that Broward was one of the quickest coalitions that formed. Um, and we've done some great work. And I really want to thank everybody for joining in. Uh, again, we have to chase joy. We have to help each other. And together, we can really solve uh, suicide and make that 100% preventable here. Now, my honor to introduce the funder for this, and again, another amazing partner, Sylvia Quintana. I know you are on, and thank you so much for being with us and all your leadership. Well, thank you, Kathleen. As you know, we've always been great partners, uh, and we have really uh, benefited from the stakeholder partnership from the whole community. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of how we got here so that we will have a context of how far, how long ago Broward really began to look at this concern with suicide. And I can tell you that even before 2017, Children's Services Council's uh, leadership group was asking questions as to what can we do um, to prevent suicide. At the time, I think that there were quite a few suicides in the Western area. And uh, the school system was asking, how can we prevent this stuff? So the community has really been pondering and wondering what, how to work on this issue for a while. Um, with BBHC, uh, we had a one community partnership grant that a lot of us are a part of. And through the research study of, uh, of, of, of one community partnership too, we learned that um, children that we had in our grant, in two, this is back in 2017, that were being asked about how well they were doing as part of the implementation of services that were being provided. Of course, they were doing much better and well, and as, as you know, the result of that initiative 
turned out to be very successful. One of the things that really concerned us was the fact that there was still suicide ideology being identified uh, through this whole process. So um, we decided to meet with our Broward Behavioral Health Network providers, which are more than 32 providers, and ask the question as to what are we doing? Because I know that we do screenings when we have people come in or where they have signs, but what are we doing about the ongoing ideology that people may have and keep quiet? Because a lot of us are looking at treatment from the perspective of us of how are you participating in the community? Are you going to school? Are you making good grades? Are your parents happy with your behavior? Um, are you successful in your goals in life and so forth? But sometimes for people, that there's something else going on within them that they don't share. And they still think at times, especially when they're dealing with issues of suicide as an option type of thing or suicide as an entertainment part. So that really concerned us a lot. And we wanted to make the network aware of what can we do as network providers, especially if we have people in treatment, to ongoingly check with people to see how they're doing as far as suicidal ideology which I think is a point where we can, like Kathleen, you mentioned, we want it to be preventive, right? So if you're thinking about it, then let's talk about what's going on and what else can we do instead of that. And so back in 2017, One Community Partnership 2 began to work with our network providers through our QI initiative on what to do. And at the time we were looking at various platforms for the approach, Zero Suicide, of course, was one that we really liked a lot. And we began to investigate some of the tools that we could use for quick assessments of these. Um, later on, um, of course, MSD happened, which was a tragic event in our community. And we were aware that that was going to be a trigger for more suicides as people did not know how to cope with that event. Um, 2019 came about with the anniversary and we did have some suicides out of that initiative. And at the time, we at BBHC were looking for responses to, like I said, intervene earlier. At the time, I was at the National uh, Behavioral Health Conference where I met April uh, Foreman, and I was asking uh, nationally for help to, for Broward County to see what can we do, what can we bring in from the outside to help us move forward. And it was April that helped us put together, remember we, we came back with a group that we put together and sent to Colorado to the uh, suicidology uh, conference where we all send our representatives to come back with information and come up with how do, what do we do and at the time uh, we came up with the idea of this coalition that we just formed and april was our consultant for a while i think um, and of course united way has always been our prevention arm in our community and uh, thank god that we were able to with the help of dcf because i want to tell you that dcf as you know is our funder uh, we were able to bring this to a high priority and our board approved seed money because in reality our funding to you is like seed money to begin this collaborative. And um, I'm really proud of the fact that Broward Behavioral Health Coalition was able to help out with that piece. And, uh, and the fact that DCF has continued to help us support that effort and our board. And of course, I don't know if someone's gonna talk about the cultural totally of this coalition, but it's an awesome coalition made up with all the systems and stakeholders in the community and uh you know and we've we've formed really a very successful we've been working on this thing for a whole year i know um and we've created various work groups that have worked in various aspects of this thing so with that i don't want to talk more about this because i'm sure somebody's going to talk about how the structure of the coalition works but i'm really proud and very happy um to be here today to support the launching of this Zero Suicide Broward, um, and hopefully it will not just be um, with just BBHC provider networks, which are a lot of the treatment providers, but that we really span this throughout to see whether all of our funders adopt this, 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 this whatever the presentation that we're going to have with this initiative. And anyway, I'm going to then, I don't know, Lois, who goes next, but I'm going to let you introduce the next speaker. Thank you. thank you so much, Sylvia, and thank you for your ongoing support and the support of Broward Behavioral Health Coalition. 
I would next like to introduce our chair of the Broward Suicide Prevention Coalition. She is fabulous, Ms. Suzette Fleischman. She is the Regional Director for Behavioral Health at Florida Department of Children and Families, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Southeast Region. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to you, Suzette. Thank you, Lois. I appreciate that. And thank you, Sylvia. Um, you know, Barb Behavioral Health Coalition does a lot of good work in, in this community and, um, and saw the need existed and as such uh, moved swiftly and um, promptly to address the issue in collaboration uh, with uh, United Way and all the other stakeholders in the community that were named by Kathleen. So thank you all. Um, that said, in the United States, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. And so we know that it's a huge problem in our country. Although women attempt suicide more than men, more American men are dying by suicide. This is because in general, the men uh, select more lethal methods such as firearms, um, and it is important to note that every 26 seconds, someone attempts suicide. So in the 13 minutes that we've been here um, in this um, summit, there have been an, uh, approximately 26 attempts at suicide. Uh, and it generally will cost the US $69 billion annually. Next slide, please. In Florida, suicide is the eighth leading cause of death. Um, as a state, we are slightly below the national suicide rate, but still see many deaths and experience a huge impact each year. Um, you could see that we're ranked 37 out of 50 uh, states for the highest suicide rate. Uh, suicide costs Florida 2 million I'm sorry, two billion eight hundred forty-one million seven hundred thirty-nine thousand annually. Next slide, please. These are the completed suicides in Broward County for the last six years, including current data for 2020. This information came directly from the medical examiner's office, who provides. Sorry. I'm getting emails, um, who provides the death reports periodically. In 2018, Broward County saw a huge spike in deaths, which resulted in an increase of prevention efforts. If the trends for 2020 continue, we will continue to see a downward trend at the current rate. The projected number of deaths for 2020 is 188.63. Uh, Next slide, please. So in this slide, you will see that males are represented by the blue color and females by the gold color. And what you can see is that year after year, males are three to four times more likely to complete suicide than males. Again, females attempt suicide about three times more often than males. Often when we think about suicide prevention, we think about adolescents and young adults. As you can see, adults age 40 to 64 are consistently at higher risk for suicide death in Broward. They're followed by those who are 65 and over, and then those who are age 25 to 39. This doesn't mean uh, youth are at risk. Many suicide prevention programs are focused on youth prevention and may be effective. However, this knowledge does provide us with an opportunity to engage with our older population. Next slide, please. Thank you. This chart represents Completed suicides by race, keep in mind that this is the, uh, the race indicating on the death report by the ME and may not be how the person identified. When you break this suicide deaths down by race, whites are at significant and high risk 
for completing suicide. The next highest risk group is Black and Hispanic. Those identifying as Asian or as Asian Indian seem to be at lowest risk. Next slide. Here you will see completed suicide by method. Year after year, gunshot wound is the most used method of death for suicide in Broward County, which is followed by asphyxia, including such things as hanging or suffocation. Poisoning includes overdose deaths ruled as a suicide. It should be noted that there may be deaths ruled as accidental overdoses that may have been suicides and vice versa. Blunt force injury usually means a fall from a height or a train accident. Next slide. Since firearm deaths were most common, we wanted to take a closer look at the demographics of those dying by self-inflicted gunshot wounds. Looking at the complete 2019 data, you can see that older white males are most frequently dying by suicide using a firearm. And I turn it back over to Lois. Thank you, Suzette. That was some really insightful data, and we appreciate you and your leadership through this whole project. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to introduce Ms. Cindy Ehrenberg Seltzer. She is the President CEO of Children's Services Council of Broward County and a supporter of the coalition. Thank you, Cindy. Thank you, Lois. Um, it's really difficult to put a happy face on after hearing the <laughs> data provided by Suzette and um, Sylvia, but I would like to focus on how happy I am to see so many participants. 252 people at this point have realized throughout our community how important it is to be trained on this methodology of zero suicide. For the Children's Services Council, I, I remember first um, addressing this issue when it was like a knife to the heart when one of our after school programs came to do a presentation for the council on the big project that they had been working on all year. And it was about how to prevent their friends from committing suicide. They had come up with a poster and come up with the idea of putting the 211 number and prevention, <clears throat> prevention information on the back of their student IDs. And I gotta tell you, until then, I had not really thought of suicide in connection with children. And after seeing that, we knew we had to ask questions and help spur action. Of course, we weren't the first. 211 had already been doing this work <coughs> and has been that lifeline for years that we have supported as well. So we were jumping at the chance to be part of this coalition and have devoted quite a bit of staff time to participate in the many communities. One of the things that came out of the coalition, we didn't know what methodology we would use, but as um, Sylvia pointed out, zero suicide was the approach that made a lot of sense because we need to we want to have a standard a standard of care that we could make sure to infuse throughout the community this is so typical broward i mean i'm just so so delighted to be a leader in this community because you put out the call to your fellow ceos we all jump to the chance to work together and we recognize the need to coalesce around, whether it be in literacy or mental health and trauma, suicide prevention, we recognize that if we all work together and push out a consistent message and consistent training, that we can all really work together in a much more effective way. And so that's what you're gonna be hearing about today through the Zero Suicide Broward. We want you all to become zero suicide competent and that way we can ensure that people will receive the highest quality and continuity of care, no matter what door they come through. And we know in Broward, there are many doors that can be your entrance into either the physical or mental health um, 
systems of care. So zero suicide was selected because it's highly individualized and it allows you, you the provider, to implement evidence-based practices in the way that works for your agency. So it's not cookie cutter, but it can still create a standard level of care. I wanna thank you all for participating today. It, again, it's incredible to see that when the call goes out, so many step up to the plate to make sure that they are serving the community in the best way possible. And know that if you're serving children, we're here for you. Thank you, Cindy. We really appreciate you participating and, and for your support. Our next speaker is Barb Gay. She comes to us from the Zero Training Institute, so she is a, really a wealth of knowledge on this topic. I am going to turn it over to Barb and bear with me as we switch PowerPoints here. There we go. And Barb, you can feel free to take it away. Great, thank you. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'm glad to be joining you all. This is such an exciting event. And um, I know as we talk about this during suicide, um, the month in which we recognize and work on suicide prevention specifically, I hear you all saying we do this year round. We do this all the time. And I have to tell you, when I first started um, having conversations with, uh, with the United Way and heard about the background work that had been done, um, you know, I was really, really impressed with the work that has already taken place because you've done homework. You went out and found, um, you identified the issue, you found the work that, um, that was working across the country and you started taking the steps to put it into place. So you're in a perfect place to start kicking off um, what's called the zero suicide framework. Um, so the zero suicide, we can go ahead and jump to the next slide. I'll tell you a little bit about um, the, who I am and, and what we do as we go in these first couple of slides, but then we'll spend our time talking about what exactly is the zero suicide framework and how do you get involved. Um, so my name is Barb Gay. I serve as the manager for the Zero Suicide Institute. Um, prior to uh, working with the Institute, I was in community behavioral health care. And uh, I live in Iowa. Um, I work from my home in Iowa. And uh, so prior to joining the Institute, we're, we're housed, our offices are on the East Coast. Um, uh, here in my community, proud to have been a partner agency with our local United Way as well. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. And the Zero Suicide Institute is a part of the Educational Development Center. So EDC is a nonprofit, uh, we're a global nonprofit that works on um, education, health, and economic opportunity worldwide. But a large portfolio for us is on suicide prevention. Um, you're gonna hear mostly today, I'm gonna talk about three groups um, at EDC that work on suicide prevention. So mine um, specifically, the Zero Suicide Institute. So we'll jump to the next slide and I'll introduce you to the Suicide Prevention Resource Center. If you're not familiar with this um, resource center already, I wanted to make sure today that you, that you capture that website down there at the bottom and take a look at it. This is the nation's federally funded a resource center to support and advance the work on suicide prevention. So we're going to talk specifically today about the initiative of zero suicide, um, but there are so many resources available at SPRC, I didn't want to miss the opportunity to tell you. On the next slide, we'll see um, just a glimpse of what's there. Um, one piece I wanted to point out today, though, was training. Um, a lot of training that's available um, online. I know we're all getting used to that now in the world of uh, response to COVID. We're all doing everything virtually uh, for the most part, but we have a lot of trainings that are there and many of them um, have no fee. One in particular I want to highlight today, which is our CALM training, counseling uh, on access to lethal means. So um, you, you saw that data specifically around um, deaths by uh, suicide or by gun and I wanted to just show you this CALM training, because not specifically does it talk about um, guns as the only means for suicide death, but that clearly is the one that is most fatal. And so understanding how you talk to somebody about what their, their intended means to die by suicide is and how you help them um, create a safety plan is really a, a very key um, component of suicide prevention. So just wanted to make you aware of the CALM, C-A-L-M, Counseling on Access to Lethal Means Training that's available um, at SPRC. Okay, we can then go ahead to the next slide and we'll start talking about 
zero suicide. Um, zero suicide really does have uh, a healthcare focus, but as we talk through this today, we'll see how the entire community supports this healthcare initiative because our patients, um, you know, they're having contact with all of your organizations. I love the idea of it doesn't matter what door they come into, whichever organization or agency they walk into, we want to make sure that we have um, staff who are competent and comfortable talking about suicide so we get patients directed to those who provide the, the care that they would need um, when they're feeling suicidal. The next slide will help us understand about why we focus on healthcare. Um, so this is a couple of goals from the 2012 National Strategy for Suicide Prevention. It's important because at this, um, in, at this time in this document, we, there was a call for suicide prevention to become a core component of healthcare um, for improved professional and clinical practices. Um, this was the first time that it was called out to have uh, an, uh, an intention to reduce suicides in healthcare. So the first time that we had done that. Um, prior, um, healthcare systems generally operated um, with the belief that suicide was an unfortunate but inevitable part of caring for people with mental illness. We didn't understand um, what responsibility we had as a system and what initiatives we could put in place to actually prevent suicide death. So what we've seen um, since here, we'll talk about as we have some time together this morning, is that we have some um, healthcare system leaders in this country who said, you know, they just didn't have that same belief. Um, and they questioned that myth, and they were able to put these practices into place and have, um, and have shown that it can reduce suicide deaths for those in their care. We'll go ahead and go to the next slide. I'll do a quick introduction of what is zero suicide? What's the framework? Um, the National Action Alliance for Suicide Prevention came up with this framework following that national strategy uh, identification and those goals. And it has seven elements, right? And so you can see them outlined here and they all um, work together. So these are laid out linearly. I'm gonna show you another slide a little later where we show how they're actually all um, connected because it is a continuous quality improvement process. This is a systems change approach. And, and what that means is in that first lead element that it's the entire system committing to changing the culture to reduce suicide. Um, it focuses heavily on what training needs to be provided for every staff member, not only our clinical staff, but every staff member. And uh, we focus on those three C's there, the competent, confident, and caring workforce. So all three of those are important. Providing, a, providing the opportunity for education is simply not enough. We wanna be sure that the skills are there to work with patients who may be experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideations or um, exhibiting suicidal behavior. It starts with identification. Oh, we're gonna stay on the slide. Just, yeah, one more second here. I'm, I'm gonna walk through all seven of these quickly for you. The identification element um, it means that we, we do universal screening for all patients at all visits. So remember back we said this wasn't a core competency and it was only then that we were doing screening for individuals who had, um, I, you know, had shared their suicidal thinking or that maybe had a, a mental health diagnosis. But today we're talking about all patients who come into care getting screened. Um, once we have um, that identification and the screening, then it's about a good engagement so that we put patients um, on a suicide care management plan so that they get the right service at the right time. We treat directly the suicidal thoughts and behaviors. We don't treat the other issues that the patient may have, what symptoms or diagnoses, but that we make sure we've got treatments um, and providers who are trained in those specific research-based treatments. Um, that the system um, and the organizations accept responsibility to support our patients throughout the care. So when transitioning in levels of service or transitioning between organizations or transitioning back home, if they've had an inpatient stay, that the system accepts that responsibility to support the patient. And as I mentioned, that improve element is so important. Um, you, you saw some data early on. You're going to hear me talk about the need to, to monitor your data because you need to see if what we're doing is making a difference, right? We want to know if we're um, implementing the correct strategies for our communities and for those people that, that choose to be in care with us. And if we're not, 
then we go back and we reevaluate re re what we are doing. Okay, so now we can jump ahead to the next slide. So, so why why the focus on healthcare? Um, you know, when when we took a look at um, what can we do, um, what can we do to prevent suicides in this country? One of the um, some of the key data that stood out was the number of patients who had seen a healthcare provider um, prior to their death by suicide. So we knew that individuals who were at risk for suicide were coming into care, but they were going on to die by suicide. And so why, why was this happening? Um, and, and what we found was that generally we weren't asking directly about suicide. We were making some assumptions or we may have asked the question, but we may have asked it in the way in which it was um, communicated to the patient we didn't want them to answer. So perhaps um, you can relate to this if it's ever happened to you in, in, in a screening where someone says, and, and believe it happens to me, right? When I say I work for the Zero Suicide Institute, I still have this experience um, where someone will say, you're not thinking about suicide, right? Or the person doing your screening has their uh, face looking at the uh, instrument so they can enter your aunt questions into the into the tablet or to the laptop. So they're saying, are you thinking about suicide, but not making any eye contact? Um, and this isn't a fault of an individual. What we know is that we had not been training our clinicians and our practitioners um, and our entire staff in addressing suicide risk. I'm going to go to the next slide. Thanks. So, so why zero suicide? Um, couple of things that came up about this that I want to share with you. Um, in the past, oftentimes we've set goals as a nation to reduce suicide by 10, 20, 50 percent. In local communities, we've done that as well. And we've had great efforts, um, but we really started asking ourselves, but is it sufficient? What are we really aiming for? And the National Action Alliance looked to other industries, um, two in particular, airline and, and nuclear plants, right? They aim for zero disasters. They focus on maintaining safety by applying these to effective tools to fix problems. They monitor what's happening. They have a belief that failure is unacceptable. And that's where we came with a goal of aspirational goal for zero suicide. Um, it's not to say that we don't think that there will ever be another death in Broward County by suicide, but it's to say that as collectively we work together on this, our aim is to prevent, prevent every death. So we know it's an aspirational goal, but that's a really important um, clarification I wanna, I wanna make for you. We can jump to the next slide. We've shared with you the, the quote um, that just when we, if we're designing for less, we may not get the full result that we want. So it's purposefully aiming, aiming for that higher level of performance. Go ahead. So what, what, what happens in current healthcare are those where we aren't using um, zero suicide. We use the Swiss cheese framework. Um, it may be familiar to, to some of you. But we talk about this without improved suicide care. People can fall through these holes um, that you see when they line up. It's not intentional, but this is just how people can fall through the gap um, when we are providing care. If we jump to the next slide, we'll see how the implementation with zero suicide can help change that. Um, what we do with zero suicide is look to where we see people falling through those gaps and implement the evidence-based strategies or the research-informed practices that help us prevent people falling through the gap. Through the, um, through the gap. Um, so we talked about that screening, right? So those who, um, we, if we screen everyone, then what we do is determine who screened positive, and then we put them through for a full suicide, comprehensive suicide risk assessment, and then we identify, um, and with them, create a safety plan. So everyone who screens positive right on that same day that they have that positive screen leaves with a safety plan that they have helped create. And what that does for them is actually give them something tangible at that moment, a care plan um, that they can take away, but also helps them understand their important role in caring for themselves. 
so the other pieces that you see here when we talk about the the treatment um, realizing that uh, treating someone's depression is obviously really important but it may not treat their suicidality so we need to look how we provide treatment uh, making sure we've got clinicians who are trained. There are three evidence-based treatments for suicidality, making sure we've got those connections available. If we don't provide that treatment, um, if your organization or system doesn't provide that alone, you know, we think then about that, that last slide here, that continuity of care. How do we make good transitions um, in the zero suicide framework so that a patient doesn't fall through any of these holes? So when these holes line up, um, when we have the whole, we can have suicide death. When we improve suicide care and implement the zero suicide framework, then we fill those holes with the evidence-based practices, the system-wide accountability, and continuous quality improvement. We can go ahead and go to the next slide. So this, um, again, just a few things that are different about zero suicide. Um, and the biggest piece about that is that it's a system-wide approach and it's not just placed on any one clinician. We'll go to the next slide. Really want to be clear that you don't, we don't endorse using it as a marketing campaign. It's, it's not a name. Um, I love the zero, uh, zero Suicide Broward, but making sure that it's not just a name, that we actually have to uh, get through our next steps and actually implement this. I also want to caution you that this really is an approach that um, takes time. We refer to it oftentimes as a marathon rather than a sprint. So you're not looking to set this up and implement it in the next few months and then check your box and say, we're done, we've implemented zero suicide. This is an initiative that you take on and you commit to doing and you continue to do uh, the work to implement zero suicide. The next slide will show us the zero suicide framework. I, I just like to show this because it really does take all of these cells and elements interlocking, working together. So you'll be working on them all um, at the same time and to some degree. You'll kind of highlight which one at, at which time, but it really does take all seven of these working together. And why? Um, I'm just gonna show you slides, uh, the next couple of slides talk about our outcomes with zero suicide. You can find these on our website, on the Zero Suicide Institute website. Um, so there are a lot of stories. The next slide, I just picked a few of the highlights. Um, from a few organizations to show you some of the successes that they're having. And these in particular, because the, um, the success depends on where you start and what you're choosing to work on first within your implementation of zero suicide framework. So you'll see the training element um, addressed here. You'll see the uh, comprehensive assessment in clients um, and reduction in, um, uh, individuals actually um, having a risk for suicide and being identified. Okay, we'll go ahead and move on so I can make sure I tell you then how do you get started? Um, there's a wealth of information on the website. Um, so I showed you earlier the SPRC website. What I'm showing you here is a zero suicide, uh, we call the toolkit. So this is um, because this information was created with um, federal funds and public dollars, we can make all of this information available to you to access at any time when you're ready to begin your initiative. Um, the how do you begin? The next slide will show us um, one of the guides we have is called the quick guide to getting started. So getting familiar with zero suicide um, is at the top, making a commitment um, from your organization so understanding what that lead element is, um, gathering your implementation team, and then completing your zero suicide organizational self-study are the places um, to begin. I'm gonna show you those first few in the next couple of slides. On our next slide, we'll see the implementation team. You wanna identify individuals in your organization who can be your core team to help you guide implementing zero suicide in your organization. So we, we, we need leadership. We need someone who can make decisions. We don't want to have um, our teams come together with great ideas that then present to leadership and then have to get yeses and nos. We want someone on the team who can actually be the decision maker, someone who's got clinical experience, involving individuals who have lived experience with suicide. This can be a patient, this could be a staff member, it can be a family member, but someone who um, has either had suicide attempts or is a lost survivor. 
we've talked a little bit about the um, continuous quality improvement. So great to have someone on here who can help you with your data. Because it's a systems change approach, we want to we want to utilize all systems available to our staff, and that's why you see the last two here, um, having someone from IT and someone from safety or risk management. So get your team together. And then once your team is formed, you'll complete the organizational self-study. So that's the next slide. We'll take a look at the organizational self-study. Um, it's a series of questions that you're going to um, answer for your own organization. Your team can do this individually and share answers, or you all can sit down together and collectively answer. This is free to do um, on the Zero Suicide website as well. It's important to do this in the beginning because that's going to give you your baseline for where are you as an organization in your efforts to improve suicide care. And it's also going to serve as the Kickstarter for where do we go next? Because you're going to see where can we improve, where are we doing well. This, um, oftentimes I talk about it as being the, the guide to your action plan. Um, I want to highlight for you, it's early on, but take a look at the next slide. It's the improve. Um, under the improve element is the data element worksheet. Encourage your teams to start thinking about what data are we going to monitor and start doing that early on because sometimes it can take a little while to figure out how do you get the data, what does the data actually mean. So um, while you're initially beginning, start thinking about what data. We give some examples in this worksheet of what data can be considered, but you can certainly take a look at the data that you have available to you as well. And then the last piece I want to highlight is you will be built one of the next steps after doing your, um, your organizational self-study, because we've seen this implemented in so many places across the country, I, I know the next uh, for, for most of you will be about how do we train our staff and what training do they need. Um, we have a document on the website that will show you what are the suicide care training options for every level of staff. So you'll start taking a look at this um, as well. As we flip to the next slide, I just wanted to you know, highlight for you the institute, um, where I, that's where I am the manager, the Zero Suicide Institute and the work we do. Uh, you, you're not alone, right? This is a collaborative effort. Um, you have resources available to you. I often talk about the website as a wonderful tool, but it also can be a little overwhelming. So use your coalition um, and, and ask us some questions if you're not finding what you need, and certainly we're here um, and available as well. If we skip to the second to last slide, you'll see when you get to the website um, many of the things that we do. And that's what's happening here as you flip through these. You can see some of the services that we offer. But this next slide will show you how to contact us. And I want to point out the zero suicide email list or the listserv. Um, just as a reminder, <clears throat> and it's a great resource, but it's a reminder you're not doing this alone. This is being done across the country. It's being done internationally. And this, e and we're, this is really a relatively new um, field, right? Suicide prevention has really been a focus in the last 15 years or so, the zero suicide framework, the last five. Um, so we learn from each other. And that listserv is a great place to ask your questions um, or join that listserv so you can see what others are doing. Um, I just in encourage you to take a look at that um, listserv. And then on, um, on that too, on the website, you'll find ways to contact us. Contact us at the Institute if you do have any questions and you need some assistance. So thank you so much for inviting me and for the Suicide Institute to be a part of your kickoff. Um, I am really excited to see uh, the implementation that you're able to do and um, I'll just put it out there we always look for other outcome stories so Broward County I would love to see your outcome story get featured on the website um, talk about your journey um, that means the good and the bad what were the ups and the downs and uh, where have you come um, with your data thank you so much for your time today Thank you so much, Barb. You are just a wealth of information on this topic, and we really appreciate you being here with us. So thank you so much. So Barb has uh, introduced us to zero suicide and what that entails. I am now going to turn you over to our two co-chairs of the Suicide Response Workgroup, which is the subcommittee that is spearheading this initiative. Um, we're going to hear from them how you can get involved and what we are asking you to do. And then we'll hear from some providers who have already started and what their experience was like. 
So I would like to welcome uh, Francisco Isaza and Joshua Plants. Francisco, or Frank we call him, is from 211 Broward and Josh uh, comes to us from Memorial Health System. So thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, thank you, Lois, and uh, thank you so much for, um, for sharing how Broward County can join the zero suicide community and really achieving this aspirational goal. And I personally just wanna thank everybody for being here on World Suicide Prevention Day. I appreciate your passion for reducing suicide. And I hope everybody today will be committed to asking their friends and family and coworkers, are you okay? How are you today? And let's just check on someone today to make sure that our friends and family um, feel supported. Um, as Lois said, Joe's Plants and I are proud members of the Broward Suicide Prevention Coalition, and we're the co-chairs of the Suicide Response Work Group. And being part of this journey of transforming our systems of care to create a safer community feels so unique to me. Um, we have the, an opportunity to really cultivate a passionate community um, committed to reducing suicide. And I, I, I've been committed to this for over 20 years now that we could save lives. Um, together, we could create a robust community of competent and confident and caring services that are ready and able and willing to care for those who are seeking help. And, and as Barb shared, our commitment to a safer suicide care involves agencies completing that organizational self-study. And that helps our agencies identify our strengths and weaknesses and actions for developing a work plan on joining the Zero Suicide Broward um, community. And Josh is gonna share with you some goals established by the Suicide Response Work Group that might support your approach to joining the Zero Suicide Broward. Thanks, Frank. And thank you, Lois, for, for having us here and, and having us be a part of this uh, really System, uh, system wide effort to approach something that's, I don't think that we've done anything on this scope before. So thank you for allowing us to be a part of this. Um, as talked about earlier, we wanted to have a uh, systematic evidence based approach um, so that we're all using the same methods to understand um, how we can progress forward uh, as a community, as Broward County, to help prevent suicides. Um, so we we, we, we've started this journey about 12, 15 months ago. It, it, it seems like so much longer, um, but, um, or so quickly, it seems so quickly. Uh, so what we're asking is that, uh, as Barbara highlighted uh, in the, the previous presentation, that we're going to begin using the uh, organizational self-study guide um, so that organizations can begin uh, going through, it's a 23 criteria, organized self-study. Um, organizations can begin to look through that, uh, that, 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 that handbook and really take a critical look, a really hard look at, because we're, we're, we're trying to implement things to save lives. Um, take, a, take a look at that, get, get with your different organizations at every level um, to, uh, uh, to complete this self-study. This self what we're asking is that organizations have this self-study completed by the end of the calendar year, uh, December of 2020, um, so that we can have at least a baseline. Some organizations have done uh, the self-study before, um, but we're asking for all organizations within Broward County to complete uh, this self-study by uh, December of 2020. What's gonna happen after that is that uh, uh, probably early 2021, after we all complete the, the self-study, there's gonna be a survey that's gonna be sent out to the various organizations. That survey is gonna go over, what were some of your strengths? What were some of your challenges? Uh, what worked well, what didn't work well? So that we can come together again uh, as part of our, our subcommittee and help provide some of that technical assistance so that maybe we can link up with certain agencies that are strengths in, in one area uh, that may be challenging for another area. We can kind of connect those dots so that we're all going through this together. That's what having a nice evidence-based uh, system uh, uh, gives to us so that we can all be talking this, all, we can all talk the same language. Um, 
So we're, we're going to get that and we're going to move forward uh, as a community to, to, to accomplish this. So um, thank you for the time. I'm going to throw it back to Lois. Thank you, gentlemen, and thank you both for, for leading this charge and we're so grateful for you and, and the time that you donate to this project. So thank you so much. So like Josh men excuse me, mentioned, some agencies have begun the organizational self-study or, or completed it. And we would love to hear how that has been for those agencies. So I would love to introduce you now to, oh, there we go, Lee Greenstein. She is the Director of Quality Management at Henderson Behavioral Health. Henderson has uh, begun their zero suicide journey. So we'd love to hear from Lee how that has been. Welcome, Lee. Thank you. Thank you, Lois, and for the Broward County Coalition for inviting us to share our story. So um, it was really great hearing Barbara's presentation because it just confirmed what we've been doing and it made me feel very good. So um, what we did, I actually researched um, about, I want to say at the beginning of 2019 is when I stumbled across Zero Suicide and thought that I, this was a great framework for Henderson to begin this project. And so I'm thankful that you all picked the same one that we did. So we're in alignment um, with the way the, the whole community is going. Um, so the first thing was really um, identifying our team. And so at Henderson, we are quite large and we have many different service areas. So it was important for me to partner with different directors and all different levels of the organization to pull together a team that would represent all, all that we do. And, um, and at that point, we really started doing our self-assessment and looking at what were the areas that we did well and what are the areas we needed to work on. And so in doing that, you know, we went through that process with the team as a group. Um, we were also really lucky that in August of 2019, we were approached by Florida Link and they actually asked if we would help, if they would, if we would like their technical assistance to um, do more of an assessment and get an evaluation. And we worked with them for a while and we actually evaluated a couple of programs and looked at some of the um, strengths that we were already doing and some of the different protocols that we had in place. So that was just a little aside that I think really helped us. They provided us with forms and toolboxes and some more technical consult, you know, consultation that was very helpful in this project. Um, the one thing that I will also um, say is that, as Barbara mentioned, it, this is a marathon. And the way I look at it in our organization is that it really is like a culture shift. And we know that culture shifts take about five years. Now, we don't have five years for this, but it is hard to be as patient as it requires it to be. And for people that know me would understand that because I like want to get stuff done. And at the same time, you know, you're looking at really changing and educating a huge workforce. You know, Henderson has 750 people. So um, in keeping that in mind, it's been, you know, a kind of um, baby steps in, you know, in actually implementing or making some organizational changes. Uh, so from the assessment, we looked at some of our challenges and what we needed to do. And the other part was the training. And so we actually had all of our clinical staff do Calm, Barbara. And um, so we were using Calm for all of our clinical staff. And then we also do mental health first aid training. I'm a trainer. So all staff get mental health first aid training, which has a really nice suicide prevention component to it. But it provided a great framework also, or a basis of knowledge for support staff, or maybe some, you know, staff that maybe aren't you know clinical but work with our clients that they would begin to understand you know asking the question and what's involved in that in the suicide um in that suicide risk assessment section of mental health first aid and you know we wanted to also try to incorporate as many best practices into this best practice model so that's kind of the way we also worked on that um, and then at that point was what, you know, we recommend is like looking at all your forms, all your policies and procedures and what are the, you know, the, the starting points of people coming in and then looking at what risk assessment um, you choose to do. Um, we did also go with the Columbia and we do it 100% of all of our clients and even to the point where every time they see a clinician, we ask the question like we're doing it 
almost all the time. And, and that is a culture shift that I want to mention because I think that I experienced that staff were more hesitant to actually be asking those questions every single time they see their client more than maybe a client would receive it. Um, it was really more of our reservation and feeling uncomfortable and not the fact that, you know, if you ask a question over and over, I don't think that a consumer would really mind or care um, because it's just part of our culture of what we're doing. So we've been working on that. And um, so it's 100% all the time, which is a, a really, it's, um, it's interesting. And then also having the treatment protocol, looking at our different evidence-based practices to support when someone is high risk and how we go about making those referrals. And now we're into actually looking at more data collection as a other part. But this does not end. This was incorporated into our quality improvement program. So we're constantly, you know, we're still updating. We also got a really great safety plan from the LINK program that is a, um, that, you know, I would be really glad to share when I know we have a number of staff that are part of the team and um, we would love to be able to share this toolbox that was given to us, a wellness toolbox. So we started implementing that across the board as well. And um, so we're just excited. That's just a little bit of what we've done. It's a process. Um, it just takes time and patience and perseverance to, you know, go through it and also begin to look at changing the culture within your organization. And that's it. And anyone, you know, has any questions at any time, feel free to reach out. We'll be more than glad to help out. Thank you so and much. Course, <laughs> thank you. Thank you for sharing your experience. It sounds like Henderson is doing some fantastic things and we're very grateful for you for sharing. Um, one of our other powerhouses that has begun their zero suicide journey is Memorial Healthcare System. Um, Dr. Tammy Tucker is going to be sharing with us. She's the Associate Administrator for Memorial and we'll be sharing how their um, zero suicide journey has been thus far. Good morning, everyone. Um, we were fortunate enough to learn about zero suicide a few years ago when we attended a national council meeting um, and they had a presence at that uh, conference and we were, you know, myself and several staff that attended were very intrigued. And so we brought it back to the healthcare system. We have officially gone through two formal self-assessments, so soon to be three, um, but it is definitely a worthwhile effort because from the first one to the second one, I felt like, oh my gosh, we really haven't done anything, but it was quite refreshing because we actually had, um, certainly from the first round when we initially did our first self-assessment, we realized we didn't have lots of policies and forms and things really properly set up. The other opportunity that everyone needs to think about is how do you incorporate those questions and documents in your health record to make using it more seamless and, and easy? Because the, the biggest challenge, or I shouldn't say the biggest, one of the challenges is, you know, everybody wants more screenings done. So as Barbara Gay indicated, um, most uh, patients prior to suicide have interacted with a healthcare professional. So it's kind of a hard sell to ask a very busy healthcare professional like in a primary care office to incorporate yet another screening because everybody wants their screening uh, to be done by that primary care physician. So you've got to figure out ways that it's seamless and it's easy and using your electronic uh, health record, drop down boxes, things like that, um, that, and then, you know, you can actually embed the Columbia and it'll automatically score, for example. So those are, those are some great opportunities to, to take advantage of that. So, um, you know, we, like I said, embraced the zero suicide several years ago, did our first assessment, realized we had lots of policies and procedures. We really didn't have the appropriate language or policies or procedures at all. And so we worked on that. And then when we did our second assessment, one of the other things that we learned is, you know, we have several different types of services. So different programs were at different points in the journey. So Memorial has an inpatient crisis unit, an inpatient, you know, locked psychiatric inpatient unit. So we're going to put more emphasis and focus on suicidality than maybe an outpatient setting uh, for adults or for our prevention program for children. So as we did our different um, 
assessments, we realized we needed to have different types of programs do their own assessment. That was another thing that we learned because, for example, Josh, Josh um, who's over community youth services, you know, where they were at in their process, some things they had done better than us and something, you know, and on the inpatient hospital side and some things we had done better. And so, you know, not trying to do a one size fits all for the providers that have multiple programs. So that's a consideration you need to think about is you may need to do an assessment for one type of program. If you have a residential program, you may want to do an assessment versus your outpatient program and do different kinds of assessments. Um, the other thing that um, we did was we, um, you know, brought on routine screening throughout all our EDs in the healthcare system. Now, I'll be honest, uh, we certainly use zero suicide as a framework and evidence-based practices, but Joint Commission gave us a little push on that one as well. So for those of you that have accreditation, whether it's through Joint Commission or CARF, um, I'm not sure, as I don't, I'm not as knowledgeable about CARF on the behavioral health side, but Joint Commission does require some of these activities. So the good news, and, I, and you know, Lee, I think, can, I can't remember, Lee, if Henderson's CARF or if it's Joint Commission. CARF, and they CARF. require safety plans. So yeah, it's also yeah. required. So, so from a regulatory standpoint, these zero suicide really helps provide the framework um, so when you get um, surveyed, it, it definitely is going to put you in a good position down the road, whether you have Joint Commission or CARF or some other regulatory body, you're going to definitely do a much better job than if you did not. I'll just put it that way. So we have been able to institute routine screenings of all patients in our emergency departments, um, as well as in community use services and our outpatient uh, behavioral health uh, programs. As was indicated by Barbara, it is definitely a journey. There's always opportunities to improve. Down the road, we would like to roll out more screening in our primary care offices, the things, the programs and things that we have control over. Um, we've recently started a, a pilot project with caring contacts. So we have a targeted uh, resource that works with the patient, all the kids that have gone through our child and adolescent inpatient services, once they're discharged, they're reached out to, uh, whether it's through um, telehealth-wise or telephonically, text, and then we also follow up by sending out uh, what's called Caring Contacts, a card. And we've also been working on, and there's a lot of evidence, um, and this was work that was done, I believe, years ago through the Veterans Administration, that it's a, it's a very small, uh, cost and small effort, but it has a large impact um, by following up with individuals that have uh, had suicidality and reaching out to them and letting them know you're thinking about them, you care about them, all it takes is two or three sentences, and that's made a big difference as well. So we're excited about that. We're collecting data on how that uh, is going. We're in our first, we just finished up our first year, and we definitely have seen a reduction in um, readmissions through that program. So that's been exciting. And then we've also recently been working on leveraging some of the um, like suicidality monitoring applications or depression monitoring applications that are out there and trying to figure out how do we incorporate that in our toolbox for our patients. So, you know, those are some of the many, many things that we've done. I don't want to belabor it, but I'm certainly always available to any of you uh, if you want to talk to me in more detail or you want to talk to me about a policy. We're happy to share our policies. There's no sense in people reproducing or, or recreating the wheel. I am thrilled that our community and our provider network are all involved in participating. It's going to make our job easier in the healthcare system. Um, there'd be nothing that would make me happier than to close the child and adolescent unit and, and not have it needed. Um, we can find uh, the staff that work there. We can find other jobs for them to do, no problem. So um, thank you all for doing that. Um, I, I really feel like by rowing in the same direction um, and doing more on the front end of prevention, uh, that we can divert and prevent this disease of despairs that we see. So, um, like I said, any questions, anything anybody wants to know, you know how to reach me, or certainly Lois can tell you how to reach me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tucker. Sounds like Memorial is also really on board with zero suicide and 
are going to be a great source of knowledge for our community as we all come together to move forward. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Miss Sheila Smith. Sheila is the president and CEO of 211 Broward, um, such a critical service for our community and we're just so happy to have them and to have Sheila here with us today. Um, so welcome Sheila. Okay, am I unmuted? You are, welcome. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Um, I know we're kind of running short on time, so I'm gonna be a little bit brief, but I wanted to first say that I'm just really proud um, to partner with and support the Broward Suicide Prevention Coalition. We are going to be at 211 serving as the main resource and referral database for suicide care services. Um, most of you probably know that 211 is a 24 hour information and referral and crisis helpline. We are our helpline services are accredited by AAS, that's the American Association of Suicidology. And what you may not know is that the workers, the counselors who answer our calls, also are AAS certified as they become eligible based on their tenure with us. So highly trained um, team of people responding to the people who call us. We are also a National Suicide Prevention Lifeline partner. Um, the calls that are made to the National Suicide Hotline that originate in Broward County are generally answered by 211 Broward. So we, we work very deeply in this area. Um, some of the staggering statistics that were shared by Suzette and by Sylvia earlier are certainly being borne out in the calls that we're receiving every day. We've certainly seen a lot of increase in both suicide related and mental health calls since the pandemic started. Just to give you an example, um, for suicide related calls in April, we were seeing two a day, um, that's doubled now to four a day in August. Mental health, um, we were seeing 36 calls a day in April, that's increased to 62 a day um, by August. Those trends seem to be increasing each month. Um, so critically important time for this initiative. We also understand that when someone is in crisis, it's, it's urgent that they can, that it's fast and it's easy for them to access resources and information. Of course, they can also always dial the 211 helpline number, but we also have a web database that people can use to search for resources in the local community. There is a filter function for suicide prevention, intervention, treatment, and postvention services. So it makes it really easy to find and connect with those providers who are offering the services that an individual might need or a family might need. Um, having said that though, it, in order for us to be able to give accurate information to the community, it's essential that agencies can update their information with us. Um, we require updates once a year. We need updates more often than that because we know that there are always changes in programs and services. So as things change or as, as things are added, it's really important to update the information with us. I know that there was a new form that was included in the materials that will be distributed for this particular event, but you can also go to 211 data or you can email 211 data at 211-broward.org. And we have a team of data resource specialists who will respond and make sure that we get your information updated as, as quickly as possible. So can't emphasize enough the importance of, of that. Um, again, very proud to be part of this initiative. We are an incredibly collaborative community and I know that we will, we will save lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sheila. Thanks for being here with us. Um, and again, I wanna echo you and reiterate the importance. We're asking all providers to update their profile and you were emailed that that form. Thank you so much, Sheila. We really appreciate everything you do. And to wrap us up, we are going to pass it back over to Sylvia Quintana um, to, to bring us home. Sylvia, you're muted. Let's unmute you here. Okay, got it. There Sorry. We go. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's been very exciting to hear all of the presentations to kick off this wonderful uh, uh, initiative of Zero Suicide Broward. Um, I think that um, the United Way will do an awesome job in leading this effort. 
I think that uh, as a group, as a coalition, uh, we will work together with all of you in setting up like a community action plan uh, to really measure uh, how we are going to be moving forward in achieving all the steps outlined by Barbara. Uh, I think that, um, that, that we're all into this together. I think that everybody can play a part. And I believe that, that self-study is the first thing that we have to tackle. And from there, uh, although each community would set up their own self-assessment and action plan to move forward, as a coalition, when we hear the needs from each of those um, providers' um, action plan, as a coalition, we can come together to brainstorm how to support those efforts. So I'm, I'm really thinking based on this information that we gathered today, that as a coalition, we can come up with our own kind of like big vision action plan to see how all of us are moving forward in this effort. And with that, I really thank you all, the United Way, CSC, all the members that have presented to one one Memorial, of course, Henderson, who has been a really got a great guiding light in this process too. Um, and uh, I look forward to working with you all in, in uh, implementing this action plan. And hopefully next year at this time, we can talk about the results of our effort for the following year. So thank you so much. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you again for your leadership. We are just so excited to be able to do this work and that is all thanks to you. So we really appreciate you. If you have any questions at all or would like some support, my contact information is listed on the screen. We will be sending out a recording of this um, webinar as well as some slides via email uh, later today or, or early tomorrow. Um, thank you so much for being here. Please feel free to share the resources, share the recordings, um, and have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, panelists. I really appreciate your time. Okay, we're being...